Chris Monsier and Rob Bertini, who is in Orlando helping out uh, some engineering students in a steel bridge competition in Orlando, uh, Florida today. Uh, could be as hot there as it is here today, perhaps. Um, and we welcome you to the weekly transportation seminar. If you're new to our seminar, I'm going to remind everyone that uh, we do webcast the seminar live and then we put the archived versions on the web. And that is why we use these microphones, because they record so people uh, watching on the web uh, can hear. So when you ask a question, you need to hold the touch. Uh, it's not really a button. The touch area on the microphone so the red light is lit while you're speaking so people can hear your question. And we do have people watch on the web. That has been confirmed. So this, <laughs> we're not doing this for nothing. Uh, and we actually have, if you're watching live on the web, you can send questions to psuseminar at yahoo.com and we get the questions and sometimes we're able to have time to an ask them. Uh, so that's the uh, friendly reminders. Uh, this is our second to last week um, of the seminar for the year, and then we'll start back up in, uh, in, in September. Uh, I'll announce it at the end, but I'll announce it now as well in case we lose some people. Next week's speaker, we have uh, Professor Sandy Rosenblum from the University of Arizona, who's going to be speaking, I don't have the title in front of me, but about transportation and the elderly and designing communities. Um, with the elderly in mind. Uh, excellent speaker. I highly recommend um, tuning in or visiting us that day. Uh, but today we also have two excellent speakers, two of our own homegrown uh, planners. Uh, so we have two of our MERP students speaking today, both uh, about their uh, field area paper research that they've been doing that they're just about done with. Uh, they're both graduating in a few weeks. Uh, and so first we're going to have Matt Lasky talking about a project he's worked on uh, about bikes on light rail trains, Max. And then secondly we have Jay Rankins who's going to be talking about grocery store uh, size and travel to shopping to grocery stores. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt and we'll switch about halfway <coughs> through between the two speakers. Thanks Jennifer. So uh, just to reiterate, I'm going to be talking uh, about my uh, the research that I've been working on for my field area paper, understanding the link between bicycles and light rail here in Portland. Um, uh, the, the paper that I'm working on hopefully will be done in a couple weeks so I can graduate and move down to California. Um, so the, the, re, the research that I used here is basically a lot of it is the result of a survey that I created and administered on, on MAX trains. I'll present, like Jennifer said, I'll present for about 20 minutes and I'll have time for questions and then we'll move on to Jay. So to give you a, an overview of what I'll be talking about, first I'll, I'll discuss my research question, uh, why I'm doing it, or why I, yeah, I guess why I'm doing it, why I'm in the process of it. And then I'll talk about why it's important, uh, this connection between bicycles and, and light rail. And um, then I'll back up and talk about how Portland's a, a great bicycling city, and I'm sure some of you know about that. And I'll talk about Max and how the history of uh, the short history of bikes on Max here in Portland. And then we'll dive into my uh, fascinating research, and uh, I'll talk about my survey, my methodology, methodology, the response rate I had, and some pretty maps and charts, and uh, my findings and recommendations. So my question is, how can Portland increase its bicycle mode share with uh, the help from transit and uh, more specifically MAX or light rail here in Portland? And for me, this question stems back to uh, my first year in Merp stardom when uh, a group of us for a couple classes dissected the Portland Bicycle Master Plan. and. Uh, so we looked at it and kind of dissected it, um, critiqued it, things like that. And in there, there's a section, section five, that discusses the practicality of improving the link between uh, bicycles and, and tran transit in Portland. 
And this includes um, improving the link, whether it's on the road or improving bicycle parking at stations and some other things. Uh, however, there's no, uh, there's no benchmarks or really a uh, course of action to, to look at this, this connection. So hopefully this research can maybe get the ball rolling in terms of that. Um, other other uh, reasons why I'm, this is important, basically it's never been done. Bicyclists haven't been surveyed on Max ever before. Uh, I have 94, 95 up there because uh, that was the last time that permits were used for bicyclists. And so this was like their way of recording how many bicyclists were actually getting on Max. And so, I mean, there, there's no clear number of that now. And so hopefully this research can also, you know, gain a better understanding of who this population is, where they're coming from, where they're going, why they're doing it. Uh, things like that, and ideally, uh, eventually, uh, with improvements, and it could increase the max ridership in the future. So, uh, what are the benefits to this this link between bikes and, and max? There are, I guess, I want to say for for TriMet, I guess it, it'd be. Um, beneficial because it increases the catchment area around existing max trains. Um, like if a, a pedestrian takes a pedestrian walk, takes a pedestrian 20 minutes to walk one mile, and it takes a bicyclist, say, 10 minutes to walk or to ride one mile, perhaps that bicyclist would, you know, in turn just ride two miles because it's, it's the same amount of time. And so this in increases the population that um, could, would, maybe uh, get on max. Um, bicycles are obviously non-polluting uh, compared to vehicles. Um, you know, vehicles have cold starts and emissions, and bicycles don't have that. So, you know, with enough people transferring from their, their vehicle to a bike, this could be beneficial for the environment. In terms of land space, uh, specifically talking about bike or park and ride facilities, uh, vehicles, park and ride lots, you know, are, can be enormal, enormous. And then when you compare that to a, a bike and ride, you know, it's a bike and ride would be tiny. So um, I'm not saying that re it'd be important to you know replace all park and park and ride lots with bike and ride. But you know, if you can get more people riding their bike, then you can decrease the size of these park and ride lots and that's good because you know bike and rides cost less to operate and, and to build and you know you can do other things with that that uh, the space that's available uh, and also for the the bicyclists it's uh, there's benefits for this link um, to avoid hills you know you hop on the, the light rail have it go up the big hill for you and you get out and you ride on your way to avoid bad weather like here in Portland, you know, in the middle of the day it snows. How are you going to get home? Because that happens so often. Um, roads, you know, if there are facilities that don't have bike lanes or uh, they're just bad bicycling, you know, areas, you can, you know, this serves an altern as an alternative to, to get from uh, one place to another. So now I'll back up a little bit and talk about Portland as a bicycling city. Um, as you may know, uh, the city was named Best Bicycling City by Bicycling Magazine in 1995 and 1998. Um, there are, you know, numerous reasons for this. One being there's such a, you know, almost 2% of commuters go by bike. And you compare this to the rest of the country, it's like, it's less than half a percent. And so that's pretty impressive. And this could be attributed to many things, um, including the Portland Bike Master Plan, I think, served to, serves to help that, as well as Metro's policies, um, you know, the bike there mapped to, to have all these facilities and people can use them. Um, so this is great, but of course there's a lot of room for improvement. 
especially when you compare the you know the two percent commute rate by bike to European examples, which you know in the Netherlands I I read somewhere that's like thirty percent. So I mean there's there's a lot of room a lot of room to groove. Um, Max, um, I'm sure many of you are aware, began it, uh, what Max is. Well, maybe not what it stands for, but what it is. Um, began in 1986 with the blue line, then expanded 90, that expanded in 98. Red line came on in 2001, and then the yellow line in 2004. Uh, covers about, if you lay all the tracks in one direction uh, for all the lines, it's about 44 miles. Um, and TriMet says it serves about 97,000 trips per day on ma on max, and this is just under a third of their their daily ridership. Oops. Uh, so brief history of bikes on max. Um, so max began operation in '86, and bikes weren't allowed on until '92. Um, this is due to some advocacy by, I think, the, the BTA had a strong role in it. Um, from 1992 to 99, bikes weren't allowed during afternoon rush hour, evening rush hour. And uh, originally, permits were necessary to bring your bike on transit in, in, in Portland, including Max. Um, and they were $5, and they were good for one year. And you had to renew it. And then they eventually decreased to a dollar and they were good for one's lifetime. And uh, the permitting process included a six minute video that you had to watch in order to, uh, to get your permit. And uh, it, it showed how to you know, board your bike on transit safely. And then permitting stopped in 2003 and now anybody, anyone at any time can bring their bike on, on max. So now we will uh, get into the research, the hot, hot topic. Uh, my methodology was a survey, and uh, it was about a five-minute survey. I, it included a business reply, so if people didn't want to fill it in on the spot, uh, it went back to TriMet, which then forwarded it to me. Um, I, I administered it wearing an, an orange TriMet customer service vest, which I don't have a picture of me in it, but you guys could imagine it. Um, I surveyed during the morning commute hours, which I defined as 7 to 10 a.m., and I tried to hit about every, I tried to hit every line and direction around 20%, like 16 to 20% of them. Um, and in the parentheses, you see the total number of, of trains during that 7 to 10, 7 to 10 a.m., uh, those hours. And there's a lot of max writing for me. Um, here's my survey. Uh, I had about, f or I had 49 total surveys uh, in various uh, levels of completeness. I had a response rate of about 77%. Um, I only had 15 refusals. And I think this is uh, largely due to the fact that um, people could fill it out on the spot. So I, I'd stand there while they filled it out, and it took them five minutes. And you know, it could, depending on the line, it would take you know, a stop or two or three, and depending on the speed of the person. So th that was pretty good. Um, and like I said, so only 6% had uh, mailed it back. So they mailed it back to TriMet, and then I, they were sent to me. Uh, in terms of results, demographics, a lot of men. Uh, three quarters of the, about three quarters of the uh, respondents were men. Average age was 35 years old. Um, half the, about half the uh, respondents had a vehicle available to make their trip. And uh, the other half did not. 96% um, of the respondents were employed, uh, a student or both. And the remaining 4% were unemployed. Um, I guess that's just a product of Oregon. But the uh, 
employed in student, the high percentage of student employees and students might be attributable to the, the hours in which I did the survey. And on average, the uh, respondents bring their bike on max four to five days a week. And um, other than riding to and from max, these, these people you ride their bike four to five days a week also. So it kind of gives you a sense of, of who these bicyclists are, that they're kind of more the, the expert bicyclists if they're riding, you know, four to five days a week. Uh, destination, again, um, a product perhaps of when I, I did the study, um, over 80% were going to work. Um, yeah. Now I'm just going to, this. now I'm getting into uh, boardings and deboardings of uh, station at stations. And so that, those are all three of the max lines, uh, the red, blue, and the yellow. And um, I added all the boardings and deboardings at each station, and I, I'm calling that uh, station activity. And so um, you can see that the, the most activity is happening uh, here, or let me see, here. This is Goose Hollow and Sunset and the, the Rose Quarter, which you can see here. Um, so, I mean, there's activity everywhere along the max line, I'd say, except for uh, east, of, east of Gateway, which is this guy. You guys see that? You guys see me? Yeah. Gateway. And, um, yeah. So then breaking that down into uh, direction, uh, westbound, eastbound, southbound, northbound. Westbound, eastbound are red and the blue line. Southbound and northbound are the yellow line. Is the yellow line. Um, so obviously there's a lot more westbound and eastbound respondents because I, there's a lot more trains and stations on the red and the blue lines that where I was surveying. And so I plotted these the westbound and the eastbound activity as well. And here is the westbound. And um, there, and so there's no yellow line because this is just the the west and the east eastbound. Um, again, there's you can see some holes east of Gateway and uh, basically nothing from Gateway to the airport. Um, the most active again are uh, Goose Hollow and Sunset stations. And then looking at eastbound, uh, a lot of the similar things. Uh, again, gateway. There I am. Gateway. Uh, a lot of holes east, east and north, and then all, a lot of activity again happening in Goose Hollow and Sunset. Yes, Chris. Does, Professor Mons here. Does that just show boardings um, and LA? Yes, it's. I basically added them together. Um, I could I could have done uh, just boardings and just deboardings, which, but those are a lot smaller numbers, just based on responses. So I thought this would be a, a good way to show it. Yes. So does that suggest that we essentially see people emphasizing trips outside the central city and kind of use Rosequater and Goose Hollow as their portals? out of the central city and they're probably riding while they're in the central city, riding their bikes while they're in the central city. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll get into a little bit more of that in terms of origins and destinations here. Now, so here I, I plotted all the, uh, the respondents' origins and destinations. Um, I asked, in the survey I asked for uh, an address, or a cross street or a landmark for each of the respondents. Um, so they could, I just said that. Um, this shows where they started and ended their journey. And, um, you know, it's pretty much all over. You can see, uh, you know, the central city here. So there are, you know, a small concentration of, of people going to their destination there. Um, so how far are these, these people going on both ends of their trips? That's what I, I wanted to figure out next. And so I... Uh, looked at the, the fastest network path 
for bicyclists accessing Max and then uh, egressing from Max to their destination. And uh, I use ArcView fastest network path extension to do this. Um, so basically, this shows people that are the people that are riding their bike to their Max station. And um, I kind of I break it down in, in numbers here in a, in a second. These are just the pretty pictures. Um, and then this is from uh, their uh, deboarding max station to their destination. And like you can see, you know, there's definitely some activity in the central city here. And then this is kind of neat because that is uh, Nike campus. And so you get you have four people. I got four respondents going there from four different max stations. Okay, so these are the uh, the numbers, the results. Um, the n's are smaller than my survey because the n values for these are smaller than my you know number of surveys because um, some people were transferring to another uh, transit, whether you know it was a bus or another max line. Some pe and some people didn't fill it out, so that explains that. Um, What's most important here is the uh, the means. Um, people are traveling further to get to their max station than when they get off, and uh, this could be you know attributed to people getting off in in downtown, and uh, you know ha not having as, as far to go. Uh, both both of the longest trips were to a max station and. Uh, I noted with the asterisks, and these are both to, to Goose Hollow. It was 13 miles and 10 miles someone rode. So that's, that's pretty far. Uh, yeah? Could you say again why you think it is that <clears throat> people are traveling longer to get to it than to leave from it? Well, I think, um, I don't, I mean, I don't really know for sure, but, um, you know, ideally, this the central city has more density and more job density, and so people people ride their bike to their max station, then they get off, you know, closer to downtown, and you know, it's closer to their job, and so they don't have to ride as far. Could it could it also part of the equation maybe be that as people are coming from Portland to places outside, that the comfort level of cycling in those two places sure. is different enough that. Um, they might be more likely to ride longer when they're more comfortable. Yeah, good one. I'll write that down. <laughs> um, so yeah, gets at that. Yeah. 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 Go back here. Yeah. As well, if I can speculate, um, the locations of housing versus location of jobs right. more concentrated around. Right. I that was you know, the whole thing that you had said, but yeah. more dispersed housing. So now um, I'm just going to talk about uh, why people are taking their bike on max. So I hypothesized six uh, reasons, and I asked respondents to rate these on a, uh, a scale of one to four, and uh, one being not important, four being uh, most, uh, very important. You can see that's, I just cut that out of my survey up in the top right. Um, and then I clumped all the ones and twos together and all the threes and fours together, and I kind of called the threes and fours um, as important. And so people found these the most important. And uh, avoiding busy traffic was number one. And then saving time was second. And then the, re the rest of them, uh, the majority of people said that uh, these were, were not important. Um, down at the bottom here, I, have a, I also uh, found a significant correlation that the the more frequent users of Max um, find it more important to avoid parking their bike at Max, and so while the 
you know, a large majority of the people found it, this not to be important. You know, it's all the way at the, all the, way at the right there. Um, the people that are using, the bicyclists that are using Maximos um, find, this, find this important. And so then I get into, uh, right here, this is my last chart. And this shows, uh, I wanted to talk about or ask about uh, bicycle parking options. And so uh, this is people's notions of security of their bike when bike parked in a bike locker, uh, bike rack, or on a signpost. And you know, overwhelmingly, people find bike lockers to be a, a secure uh, bicycle parking location. Um, a couple correlations I, I found again, or a couple other ones I found, and uh, these again are, are for the, the more frequent users, and they believe that uh, bicycle lockers are, are secure, um, and that the, the same users would use f uh, bicycle lockers more often if they were available. And I, I actually used a couple other questions for these, but they, they pertain to the bicycle locker question. And so that just leads to my findings here, just to go over them, if I haven't said them already. Uh, fewer women uh, were you know, using, uh, well, maybe using uh, the bicycle max link. And this is supported by some literature that uh, less women are, are doing this and that uh, there's less east side activity. Um, people are, uh, bicyclists are avoiding the West Hills. Um, I conclude that from uh, all the activity at the Goose Hollow and Sunset stations. Um, and also that bicyclists ride farther for their access trip versus their e egress trip. And this is also supported in literature and Lastly, that the, the expert users trust bicycle lockers and would use them if they are more readily available, or if they are available, you know, knowing that they're available. So maybe they already are, but they just don't know that they exist. And this leads in, finally into my recommendations. And uh, so I suggest marketing the bicycle transit connection to women and east side bicyclists, just because these populations were underrepresented in my my sample. Um, so, you know, if there is congestion in terms of room to put your bike on max, maybe the the place to look at this is near the west, the west, uh, the west hills. Uh, I'm not sure that this is this is necessary, but I have some more work to do on that one. Um, to evaluate bicycle locker availability and need, uh, bicycle lockers are. Uh, the system is operated by the BTA, I believe, this, yeah, the city of Portland and I believe TriMet also. And so I think just establishing um, how many of these are available and um, how many are being used and, you know, if they are available to promote them and to promote them to, to you know, the novice bicycle rider who isn't, isn't riding their, bringing their bike on, on max as often just because because of the, the findings I had before. And lastly, to, to survey more, just due to my small sample of you know just under 50, um, the more data, the better, right? So uh, that's it. And um, yeah, I'll take any questions. And if you want any more information, my, my email address is there. And questions? Yes. You measured the direction bicyclists were traveling. Did you also measure whether they were, say, traveling downtown or traveling, um, say, from the east side to west side? I was curious. It's, I, I do know a lot of east side bicyclists that work out in Hillsborough or Beaverton. Mm -hmm. A lot of those folks will actually get on at the Goose Hollow station to avoid having to sit on Max for an extended period of time as it slowly goes through downtown. Um, did your research sort of show up any trends? Um, I haven't. I've thought about that. I haven't broken down the uh, the um, 
central city versus outside the city. You know, I was thinking about maybe like the uh, the fair free zone versus outside that, but I haven't done that. Um, in terms of people, you know, bicycling from the east side all the way over to Goose Hollow, you know, I, I guess I didn't find that because the my map would have, uh, the the network path would have shown that too. So, yeah, Aaron. <coughs> I was just curious to know to what degree TriNet was involved and if they sort of directed your survey, if they were looking to learn certain things or if they just sort of provided support. Or um, I'd like that. You'd like that, right? Um, no, TriNet definitely played a role. They wouldn't let me go on Macs unless, you know, I, I dealt with them. I was lucky enough to, you know, have five months to, to work with them in developing the survey. And there are a couple questions that they, like the survey is basically mine. Uh, they, you know, they tweaked some things and they added maybe a question or two that they thought were important. Um, Caleb at the in the marketing information department definitely, you know, helped help me out with that. Um, yeah, and other than that, it was just like he got the word out to the rider, the drivers, and things like that. Who the drivers aren't really into survey surveyors, in case you're, yeah, just information. Yeah, here in front. Um, well, we should talk afterwards about bike lockers and what's going on with bike lockers at sure. transit stations. But um, besides the bike lockers, um, what what facility differences do you think there may be, or are there any, uh, between the places that are most popular for cyclists and least popular in terms of the actual stations? And the stations? Um, you know, I mean, there's the whole bike station notion, but... Um, when, I, when I say station, I mean the, the light rail station. Yeah. There are differences in those light rail stations that might be more bike friendly or more attractive to bikes than others. Hmm. So specific amenities, you're saying, or specific yeah, I mean, features? Yeah, like did you notice a difference between the places that, were, do you think that it that had an impact on, at all on, uh, you know, in terms of how that was designed or access to the station that was facilitated for bicycles or? Yeah, I, I mean, that's definitely an important um, thing, although when you look at Sunset, which is like in a cavern next to the highway, you know people are using it. So, um, but in terms of getting like a light in demand, I think you know an easy ride up station like I don't know, like at the Lloyd Center, definitely is in bicyclists' favor. Um, I know TriMet likes to, or they say that they like to get uh, bicycle parking as close to the to the actual stop as possible, and um, that's, you know, Europe does that too, and I think that's really important. And I was going to say one other thing. Oh, this isn't the actual stations, but bicyclists definitely prefer the, you know, the, the lower cars. And so when you have a, a two-car train, one with the, you know, the step up, you know, the old train, old cars, and then the flat ones, you know, a lot. A lot of bicyclists are just getting on the flat one and fighting for space there if needed rather than getting on the other one. So I think that I think the cars, the, the low level cars could, are definitely helpful for the the non expert. Because that I mean the non expert doesn't want to carry their heavy cruiser up uh, to the, the top the higher cars. Yeah, back there. Uh, was there any indication as to why the frequent Max users uh, felt it was more important that they not leave their bikes at the station? Um, no, I don't. I don't know. I just, just that. I mean, that was kind of my uh, my motivation getting into it because I don't like to leave my bike at like the Max station. It just makes me nervous, and I just assume that I'm not. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I'm a commuter. And so I assume that they have the same fears. Yeah, here. At the same topic, um, you, you talked about preferences and wanting to avoid things, but um, what were people doing with their bikes when they did ultimately, once they got off the train? Were they parking them at work? Did they have facilities in their building? I'm, I'm curious what the, where the end was. In like the when they reached their destination? Yeah, so if they weren't using the lockers at the, the train station, uh -huh. 
what were they ultimately doing? Were they locking to the staples? Did they have um, secure long-term parking in their building? Did they use a locker somewhere else? I, I was, yeah. Did you get to that? I don't know. Didn't get that far. <laughs> no. <laughs> yep. Casey? I'm assuming that you didn't ask them how much. I'm assuming you didn't ask them how valuable their bikes were. No. But that would probably indicate, I, I would guess that that would indicate whether they were comfortable leaving them. And the expert riders tend to have a lot more valuable bikes. Right. Yeah, I'd, I would equate the, exactly, I would equate the, the price of your bike with the use of it, maybe. I don't know. I didn't, though. Good. That's a good one. Yes? Did you find any riders who did a, a combination of uh, Max and a bus to, to do their trip? Yes. I had uh, five or so. Hmm. So you had a 50. Sorry? There was a sample of 50? Uh, yeah, just under 50. It's a 10%. Yeah. And uh, that was after they got off. So Max the bus. And I think I had one person go max one, one-ish, person go max the max, and nobody go max the streetcar, and one go max to private vehicle. And he, I actually talked with that guy, and he worked up in Vancouver. He had an interesting route. Yeah, let me get, go ahead. Um, in terms of the east side max stations, uh, yes. how prevalent are the bike lockers? I mean, did you just, did you notice? I, um, haven't, I haven't seen any of them. Really? Yeah, I don't know. That, I, if I have time, I'd like to get more into the bicycle locker issue. If not, I'd like to leave that to someone else. Well, the, the answer is that there's bike lockers at every station, there and the BTA has a um, free program um, where you call and you can get lockers um, through that. And for the yellow line on interstate, they're on-demand lockers. That right. Um, uh, you just go and you can use your own bike lock for those. Um, so uh, there are lockers available at every lock at every station, um, and uh, uh, they. Uh, I don't think that they're ever full. Um, so uh, I know that they do have information on their website, um, and there's also eight two three cycle C Y C L that you can call to get information, um, and all those things are promoted through. Um, various efforts citywide, um, but any help to get the word out even more, of course, would be great. That um, the issue with bicycle lockers in the BTA, I don't, and them being readily available, I don't not, I do not think that's the case. When I spoke with them um, earlier this year, they, I don't, I'm not sure how it is anymore, but originally they had a, a I think of a fifty dollar refundable. Uh, fee for a key for a bike locker, and the problem is is that people were just dropping off and they were forgetting about their fifty dollars and so they were empty bike lockers, but they thought they were being used and um, and also there's also waiting lists at some stations too so yes, how are we doing here? Cut me off. Last question. Do you have any indication that uh, capacity is a constraint, that there are people who aren't using bikes on Max because all the hooks are full? Um, that's actually, it was actually one of my questions. Um, and I'm just, actually, I'm just, that's the one thing I definitely still need to look at. Um, it's here. In the last two weeks, have you circled all that apply miss Max because the bike space were full? Boarded Max with a bike and found no spaces, had no problems finding a bike space. So, um, I mean, in my experience, there were like a couple trains, you know, at peak times, um, like specific directions that may have that problem. But I think, you know, the, the amount of time that someone would have to wait would just be like a train or two. So I think specific unique bicyclists may find that as more of a problem than it actually is. Like the ones that get, that go to the same train every day and have to wait two trains every day. They haven't waited. Okay. Kay. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks. So we're going to have a uh, quick transition.
uh, to our second speaker. Uh, soon to be graduating uh, from our program, and he's going to be talking about his field area paper research on grocery store size and uh, load choice for grocery shopping. <coughs> okay. Uh, so again, my name is uh, Jason Rankins. Uh, I go by Jay. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion usually, but um, yeah. So I'd like to begin my presentation actually by thanking uh, Jennifer Dill um, and Jim Strathman, who are the readers on my field area paper, and then also Rob Bertini for uh, pointing my nose in the right direction for a couple of key articles that I found. Um, I'd also like to do a really tiny apology uh, because... Uh, this is pretty academic in nature in comparison to Matt's. Not that his wasn't very thorough and great, um, but he had a lot more pretty pictures than I did. So I'm a little jealous. I told him before we started. So, uh, so I work with the City of Portland Office of Transportation uh, also in promoting alternative modes of transportation. And then my prior degrees are in the health area. And uh, so I really have this focus on um, how transportation and urban planning are related to health. And um, specifically because I see just over my lifetime, which is relatively short, and then researching, it seems that physical activity has been engineered out of our lives. Um, and so I was wondering, is this because we're just lazy? I mean, maybe Americans more so than others, but... I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, I think it may be that we just um, have taken on more complex lives. Uh, we have different priorities. And so time and money uh, are of utmost importance. And so uh, I was reading an article on, the, on a website uh, that looked at school size and how we're going towards larger schools, uh, one to save money, um, budget cuts, uh, but then also to provide more amenities. And so that was my original interest. And I decided, uh, just ease of use and limited time and resources, that I would look at a different institution uh, in American society, which would be the what used to be the corner grocery store and is now uh, something that has become much larger. Uh, so in the first picture that you were looking at while I was speaking, uh, kind of showed late... Uh, 19th century, early 20th century, uh, where pretty much everyone walked uh, to the grocery store uh, or had their groceries delivered. And so very few people were actually driving to the grocery store, either uh, lack of cars altogether or um, just the scale, perhaps. And so now today, the longest walk that some people make to the grocery store is the one from the parking lot uh, where they park their car. Uh, so a very brief overview of what I'm doing. Uh, I'll hit some key literature, uh, not everything, uh, because that was a big part of what I did. Um, but then lead that into my research question, uh, go over my hypotheses, uh, the measures that I used, which included uh, American Fact Finder, uh, so the Census Bureau, um, some ARC mapping, or ARC GIS mapping, and then a survey that I conducted as well. And then the results, conclusions, future directions, and uh, I'll hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end, but if you have questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask. So uh, over the course uh, of just a decade, from 1991 to 2002, uh, grocery store median size uh, increased from 32,000 uh, square feet to 45,000 square feet. And the increase in store size has been uh, related to a decrease in the number of stores. So if you have uh, a larger store, it serves more people, and so you locate them less frequently around the city. And so a lower density of stores. And uh, as such, the, in the distance traveled to the store increases, and some researchers say that that should uh, increase the number of trips taken by car. And so over the course of the last century, uh, we've increased the uh, size of stores uh, about tenfold and decreased the size of stores by, or the number of stores, excuse me, by uh, 85%. And gro grocery store, um, the market, really to be profitable and sort of make a go of it is about 10,000 shoppers, uh, which is about 
uh, I'll be talking in terms of census tracts a little later. And that's, so that's about two and a half census tracts. And uh, then uh, Handy also found that an increase in store size uh, was, had sort of a reciprocal relationship with depends, dependence on the automobile. So in her research, she found it difficult to determine whether it was uh, the dependence on the automobile that, that led to the increased store size or vice versa. Uh, so, a few studies showed that shopping trip behavior is, in fact, different than other uh, trips. Uh, shopping trips, uh, one, uh, can vary in mode, uh, two, in distance, and then also in frequency. And so, uh, a study by Cervero and Radish uh, in the Bay Area showed that dense pedestrian scale land use uh, is related to uh, more alternative modes being taken to the store, uh, decreased distance of trips to the store, and uh, increased frequency of trips. Um, but in terms of the change in ve vehicles miles traveled, uh, it was pretty much offset. Like if you were walking, um, if you were taking the car less, uh, you tended to make more trips, more frequent trips. And so it ended up to about the same, same VMT. Uh, and the vehicle avail availability in a household was related to decreased use of alternative modes of transportation. So uh, that's walking, biking, taking transit, and skateboarding, um, or rollerblading. And then uh, an increased distance to the store. Uh, so perhaps the geographic area around you hasn't changed, but you're willing to drive or travel further because you have the option of driving, which saves time. And then finally, uh, decreased median income within a household is, tends to be related to uh, fewer trips taken by car, so in turn, increased alternative modes of transportation to the store. Uh, a few more studies looking at grocery store size specifically. Um, again, increased median income is related to uh, an increased grocery store size. And that was in a study looking at predictors of grocery store size in the Atlanta area. Um, another study uh, overseas looked at shopping centers. And so they looked at three shopping centers and found that the size of the shopping center was negatively related to trip frequency. And um, another study uh, by Yim, uh, looking at some existing data for grocery stores specifically um, in the Seattle area, found that increased grocery store size uh, resulted in longer distances traveled and then uh, auto-related variables such as ownership, use, uh, more women, uh, in the workforce and more women with uh, driver's licenses resulted in a larger store size as well, or was related to, sorry, not resulted in. So <clears throat> with all this research, which actually it seemed like very little when I was looking um, because I couldn't find the stuff I wanted, but uh, so does increasing size of grocery stores influence trip mode, frequency, and or distance above and beyond land use and demographic characteristics. So a lot of people have looked at predictors of grocery store size. Uh, they've looked at trip behaviors and seen that things like median income, vehicle availability, um, and that sort of thing, and maybe accessibility, so pedestrian scale environment or bike friendly environment relate to different trip uh, behaviors. But uh, no one's looked at grocery store size specifically with these variables. Uh, especially in Portland. And so if there is, a, in fact, a relationship, what is that relationship? <clears throat> so I hypothesized that the land use characteristics and census tract characteristics, which I'll get to in a second, what I term census tract characteristics, are, uh, do, in fact, predict shopping trip mode, frequency, and distance. And so they, um, well, we'll get to the relationships in a second. And that uh, grocery store size explains those behaviors uh, above and beyond what is explained by those previous variables. And so grocery store size will uh, promote more trips by car, uh, more frequent trips, and a longer distance of trips. So this is my list of variables. Uh, so there's quite a few. There's 11, I believe. And so the first set that's in that box uh, are what I called the land use variables. And so it included how many stores are within a one mile radius, uh, number of bus stops within a quarter mile radius, number of bike or miles of bike facilities within a mile radius, and then connected node ratio, 
which is a measure of uh, street connectivity. Uh, so it was a proxy for pedestrian-friendly environments in my study, and I'll explain that in a second. The next set was the census tract variables, which I used American Fact Finder and uh, ArcGIS to interpret and analyze. Uh, those included population density, uh, median household income, and percent of households with no vehicle available. And then the last uh, independent variable is floor area of the store, so how many square feet of the store, and that was size. And then the dependent variables were um, share of trips made by car, average number of trips to the store per week, and uh, reported trip distance to the store from the origin. And so uh, I studied, or I analyzed these. Uh, again, I'll get into the measures, uh, but the analyses included a, a hierarchical re regression analyses, which is sort of a two-step regression, and I'll explain that and when I get to it. Uh, so participants, uh, we had both grocery stores and shoppers participate in the study. Uh, there were 30 grocery stores. Uh, they were throughout the Portland area, um, spread relatively evenly, uh, nine in southeast, six southwest, four northwest, nine northeast, and two in north Portland. Uh, the average median, or the average size of the grocery stores uh, was 32,811 square feet and it ranged from just over 1,000 square feet all the way up to 150,000 uh, square feet for a Costco, uh, which isn't just a grocery store, but I thought it would be really interesting to have in the analysis. Um, and then the uh, average distance from the uh, central business district, the downtown, was uh, almost four miles. Uh, so then there were 600 shoppers that uh, took the survey. Uh, 20 per store, and unfortunately, I don't. I didn't keep track of. Sort of halfway through, I was like, I should really be keeping track of the response rate. Uh, but I do know that people were much more responsive as they entered the store than leaving the store. Um, and when I get to the survey, I'll explain uh, another way that people were not included in the survey. Uh, but 60% of respondents were female, and the median age was approximately 40 years. Uh, so calculating the variables, uh, it was pretty straightforward. The number of grocery stores within a mile buffer, this is the new seasons. Uh, some of you may shop there or be familiar. Uh, the new, new seasons on division. And so I thought I'd use this as an example. Uh, so there's 13 grocery stores uh, around the new seasons. On average in the study, uh, there's eight and a half grocery stores within a mile radius of uh, each grocery store uh, in a range from zero to 22. Uh, this is number of bus stops within a quarter mile buffer. Around the new seasons, there's 16 bus stops. Uh, the average was 13 and a half, and it ranged from two to 29 bus stops within a quarter mile radius. Yes. Are those physical locations? Are those physical locations? Are are those represented by number of lines? Those are physical locations of the bus stops. So theoretically, one of those could have multiple lines coming through. Correct. Them. Yeah, probably several actually. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is bike facilities within a mile buffer. Uh, so it was uh, clipped by the mile buffer, the bike network, and then the mileage was added up. And so around the new seasons, there's 27.3 miles of bike facilities. And the average was about 22 and a half miles of bike facilities within a mile radius of a grocery store, with a range of eight and a half to 42 miles of bike facilities. Uh, that the 42 was a downtown location. And so getting back to the connected node ratio, um, so basically each of the blue dots on the screen represents a node. And you can see this one here is, uh, would be defined as not connected. Uh, so it doesn't have one or more segments leading into it. And yeah, Greg? Um, this one's curious. Maybe I should have waited for you to finish what you're saying. But it's curious to me that you used automobile connectivity to define connectivity for pedestrians. Like in Southwest, there's great pedestrian walking trails. <clears throat> um, and in Southeast, there's lots of little cut throughs and things like that that wouldn't be captured by a node look at um, road segments for cars. So I was right. kind of curious if that kind of made it. Uh, well, the cut-throughs would have been captured. Uh, the unimproved uh, right-of-way wasn't included in here. 
Um, but in terms of uh, regional surveying paths and trails, they weren't included. Um, I did think about it. Um, one was sort of ease of the process, but two, uh, more importantly, and a, a better justification, is that uh, Parks and Rec uh, conducts surveys along these trails, and well over 85%, I think it's around 90% of users are recreational users. And so in terms of the resources I would have to devote to sort of doing this in ARC GIS, because um, I'm familiar, but just enough so to be dangerous, that sort of thing. So um, I thought it would be OK to leave that out. But in future studies, maybe that should be examined, the cut-throughs and the recreational trails used for a utility trip like this. Good point. Um, <clears throat> so the ratio is basically the number of connected nodes, the blue dots that are connected to one or more, or I mean two or more segments, to all of the nodes. So just on the screen here, uh, there's 35 nodes, and 34 of those are connected. So it would be 34 to 35 would be the ratio, uh, which works out to 0.97 uh, would be the connected node ratio. So it can range from, it would be really unlikely, but it could range from zero, you would have any connected nodes, all the way to uh, one, uh, which would be totally connected. Uh, and so the average in, a, in the study was uh, 0.87. So 87% of the nodes were connected. And it ranged from about 2 thirds all the way to 100% connectivity. Uh, population density, uh, with the average was about 12 persons per acre. Uh, the median income was 32, or almost $33,000 uh, per household. And the percentage of households with no vehicle ranged from 2% all the way to 90%, uh, which was pretty astonishing for one census tract. Uh, the average was 17%. So grocery store size was the last uh, variable that was determined um, beforehand, before connecting the survey. And basically, it was done through uh, one of two methods. Uh, calling the grocery store if it was uh, connected to, if it was in a shopping center, uh, because if it wasn't, if it was an isolated freestanding structure, then I just checked on uh, Portland Maps, and which has the square footage of um, all structures of a certain age. It takes a little while to get in there. But. So the survey instrument was pretty straightforward. Like I said, I did have one screening question. I only included shoppers that shopped at this store most frequently because that was a population I was interested in. Uh, I do think that future studies should look at all shoppers, but on this one, just people who responded yes to that first question answered the rest of the questions. And then it was basically uh, the frequency, um, the mode, and the, or where they came from, the origin, which is the one thing I apologize I haven't had a chance to look at yet. It was question four. But then five would be the self-reported distance uh, to the store. And then age and gender, which are already reported on. Uh, so the results. The good stuff, the juicy stuff. Uh, there are significant correlations among land use and census tract variables. Uh, every land use variable, uh, so that first set of four, and then the census tract variables, the second three, or the second set of three, uh, were uh, related and or significantly correlated in some way. Um, the median income was negatively related uh, to all other variables. Um, included in the census tract and land use variables, whereas all the rest were positive uh, relationships. Uh, the strongest positive, or strongest negative, I'm sorry, uh, correlation was between miles of bike facilities and number of trips by car. And then the strongest uh, positive uh, for any, between any of the variables and the dependent variables was uh, store size and uh, number of trips taken by car. So I mentioned those hierarchical regression analyses. And so for trip frequency and distance, we'll kind of breeze over those pretty quickly because uh, basically the models didn't explain uh, anything significantly. And so uh, the top one here is trip frequency. Uh, the F tests were not significant. And then same thing for the trip distance. but we have some good stuff when we look at trip to the store by car. Uh, you can see the second step of the uh, regression analysis, which it's two steps. So again, entered the land use variables and then the census tract variables first, 
let that explain as much as it could, and then added this uh, grocery store size, and see, and we saw how much that explained above and beyond those other variables. And so the second step was, in fact, uh, significant. Uh, so you can see that there. And then the R squared change, uh, so how much more variance did it explain above and beyond the other variables, uh, was about 31%. So pretty good, in my opinion. But I was happy to find something. Uh, the relationships uh, in this, so the beta uh, coefficients in this hierarchical regression analysis. So there's step one and step two. Step one isn't very important because nothing was significant there. But in step two, the grocery store size uh, was related or was positively related to uh, trips made by car. And so a 1,000 square foot increase in grocery store size corresponds to about a 0.17% increase in the share of trips made by car, which doesn't sound like very much. Uh, but if you think about the fact that the range of stores in the study was uh, 1,000 square feet all the way to 150 square or 1,000 square feet, then the uh, change or variance in uh, the percentage of trips made by car could be upwards of 25%. Uh, so it is pretty significant when you think about the large scale differences in grocery stores. And um, the second, the standardized coefficient basically says if it standardizes them and compares the strength of the coefficients. And so you can see that it's uh, nearly five times as strong as the, the second uh, highest uh, coefficient which wasn't significant again. So then I did a uh, one-way ANOVA to analysis of variance to compare the largest and the smallest uh, 10 grocery stores. So basically broke it up into three categories based on size um, and sorted them and grabbed the 10 smallest and the 10 largest. And you can see <coughs> that trips made by car, as expected with the hierarchical re regression analysis, did vary. 61% uh, of trips to the smallest grocery stores were made by car, whereas three quarters of the trips, basically, to the largest grocery stores were made by car. And so I thought at first that perhaps this was because of transit, because if you think about going to a grocery store, you're going to have to carry stuff, and transit seems to be the next easiest way to do that. But in fact, transit, uh, there was no significant difference between the smallest and largest grocery stores. But there were differences for biking and walking. Uh, only 3% of people uh, bike to the largest grocery stores, whereas 8% uh, bike to the smallest grocery stores. And you can see, like Matt mentioned, that um, sort of the national average is less than 1% for biking to work. So this does support the hypotheses of other researchers that uh, shopping trips are different than all trips. And then walking uh, was 5% to the largest stores and 15%, uh, which I thought was pretty astonishing, for the smallest stores. Uh, so it does seem to support the fact that smaller pedestri pedestrian scale buildings, not necessarily um, density, um, as we can see with the other land use variables, does seem to promote walking and biking, but not necessarily transit. Uh, and then I threw in the other dependent variables just for kicks, and as expected, they were not uh, significant predictors, or they weren't significantly different between the smallest and largest grocery stores. And so to wrap it up, we have the conclusions. Uh, to answer the question that I posed in the title and throughout the presentation, grocery store size does, in fact, matter, specifically for uh, the share of trips made by car, bike, and foot. It didn't seem to have uh, much predictive value when looking at trip distance or trip frequency, which I thought was interesting. Um, so it's unlikely that the relationship can be attributed to increased distances traveled, like a lot of other researchers have shown, uh, just because there's no correlation between distance traveled, and, or no significant correlation between distance traveled and mode taken to the store. And then, um, also, no relationship between, like, the, the distance of the store was not predicted by uh, the size of the stores either. So it seems like we need to investigate this further. Um, 
So the study would serve as a great first step, uh, but a lot of things are left unanswered. Uh, so I think that the correlates of size may be a factor. So it may not necessarily be the size itself. Maybe it's that there's a sea of um, a sea of parking around the store. Maybe it's that the larger stores have more variety of products. Uh, maybe it's that the larger stores can provide uh, lower prices because they do de deal in volume, which is one of the main causes of larger grocery stores. And so I think future studies should look at these uh, different correlates of size and sort of determine what it is about size. Is it just the, f the sheer expanse of the structure or are there other things that are coming into play here? And so the future directions would start by looking at those correlates like I just mentioned. But also, um, I think both in the practical sense and then also in research, we need to look at what should the balance be between travel behavior uh, desirable travel behavior. So in my mind, that would be active transportation, so walking and biking, and then uh, value. So we seem to get lower prices at the larger grocery stores, but uh, people seem to walk and bike to those less. So where can we kind of figure out some compromises there or balances between the two? And additionally, this is done just in Portland, which is something I really wanted to do. Um, but I think it should the results should be compared to other cities, which... I can do a little of that um, as I finish up my paper, uh, but this, some of the methodology does vary, so it'll be difficult to make comparisons without doing another study. And then I think there needs to be a comparison between the urban and rural environments, because Portland is a pretty, the entire metro area is relatively urban compared to uh, other areas of the country. And so comparing the urban and rural environment may uh, explain some more of the differences especially in terms of distance traveled and frequency, which um, were failed to be explained in this study. And so at that, this time, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I know Matt and I have really appreciated having you here. Uh, and I'll open up for any questions that people may have. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious about how you defined grocery store, and specifically if, if there was a Costco on the large end of the spectrum, I'm so curious right. what was on the other end. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, the, I originally started with a list of grocery stores from a uh, shapefile uh, for ArcGIS uh, that had Portland grocery stores, and I got it from some of our mapping people at the city of Portland. Uh, but it had, it had everything in there. I mean, it had uh, like the quick, quick marts, the convenience stores, everything like that. And so I basically uh, came up with a list of products, just like some basic grocery products. One big one was produce, which some places will have milk and maybe even bread, but they wouldn't have produce. And so those were the three big ones that um, that was a requirement for an establishment to carry uh, to be considered a grocery store in the current study. But that's really good. The definition of a grocery store really, um, I think, would would influence the relationships quite a bit. Yeah, back there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes? Is the effect of size the same when the additional size comes from non-grocery items, say in the case of Costco, as opposed to just a very large grocery that was all grocery? Uh, I have yet to do that comparison. Um, I would say yes, it would, uh, regardless of the type of product. Uh, I think the size would have an influence. Um, but it's something I'll try to analyze with the existing data and should probably be investigated further. So it's primarily the increase in size, not necessarily what's sold in that increase in size. I think it, again, I think it's more than just the size. Uh, just because it's not more grocery items, I think it, I think it still could be as a result of more items being sold. Or more selection. Yeah, exactly, or more selection. So maybe you have fewer product lines, but you have more types that's a, or more variety, that sort of thing. But it's a good point. Yes? Um, in your, um, yeah, <laughs> in your uh, analysis where you did the, origin, um, the study by modes, yes. the largest and the smallest comparison, 
you didn't consider distance, right, in that? Just when I did the comparison of the yeah, smallest to the largest? It was considered, actually. Um, there. It's on the very bottom, distance is included in there. So oh. the s 10 small stores were compared to the 10 largest, and there were no significant differences between the two. Like in, in that, uh, in the bikes um, yes. comparison, so in the smallest you had like 8%? Yep, 8% of people were biking. 8%. But if the distance to this largest store was very close, like if somebody lived close to a larger store, you did consider that? Um, hmm. It's actually, it's something that I can look at more. Uh, I won't have how far each person lives from home. I mean, from the store, but I mentioned in the survey that there's a question about the trip origin, whether it's home, work, another store, or other. And so I could look at all of the people who reported coming from home and look at the differences there. So that's, a real, that's something I should look at. Thank you. Yes? In the survey of modes of transit, did you consider um, looking at how many people came in the cars that went to the store? Or, uh, and if you didn't? Uh, I didn't, okay. actually. <laughs> and, yeah. Yes, Jennifer. I have a couple. One that I think Aaron was getting at. And what was the smallest grocery store that you looked at? You can even tell us what uh, it is. Mon Paz Market uh, downtown here. It's on 10th, I believe. Uh, and it was, I think it was one, th like just under 1,100 square feet. So real corner yeah. neighborhood grocery store. Exactly. Okay. And we have a question from the web. All right. People, at least two people are out there watching. Uh, out of the other possible variables that you mentioned that might affect transportation choices, such as smaller parking lots and things like that, which one do you think is most important to explore in future studies? Of those things that I mentioned? Um, I think the, ooh, I think it's tough. I, th I think it's the, I'm not really answering the question because I'm not saying one that's most important. I think the two uh, that are most important would be uh, Parking and probably orientation of the parking, so sort of a variation on parking. So is it in the back, is it in the front, that sort of thing. And then the second or third, depending how you look at it, uh, would be the, uh, the product mix that is offered there. Yes, sir. So I'm trying to think about what policymakers would do with this data. And, you know, I guess the, the first solution, just cap grocery store size, size, I think that would not be very politically popular. Um, I wonder if more, a more indirect way of getting at it might be through system development charges and maybe making the the SDC you know nonlinear some nonlinear relationship to size and have you thought through you know sort of how you would apply this to policy making? I haven't yet, and uh, I've written my paper basically through the results section, and this uh, presentation forced me to start to look at my conclusions and uh, sort of the future directions, and so that's a topic or an area in the paper that. I will include will be practical implications and sort of some suggestions there. But yeah, that's, so that's a great idea and that gives me a little head start in that section. Uh, but I agree with you that uh, you shouldn't just put a cap on grocery store size. Like one thing we don't know if it's just the size that does matter or maybe how you do size. Um, so do you have something else or no? Okay. Yes. Right. Um, I'm going to give you my card at the end of this and we can have some more dialogue, hopefully. Great. But we in the city of, um, that I work at have capped the size of the store footprint. At, so we're, we already recognize the correlation that you developed here, as well as the impact on urban form, which is uh, another part of it. So right. that is occurring already um, within the uh, okay. world out there. So Can I ask what city you're from? Do you mind saying? I'm from the local jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out afterwards. Here, here on my own time. All right, <laughs> great. <laughs> it wasn't webcast. <laughs> Sumi, did you have a question yet? I was wondering if you controlled for surrounding land uses. For example, if, an, if a store was located in a residential area versus a strip mall. Um, was that a variable you analyzed? Uh, I looked at not necessarily the mix of the surrounding land uses um, as explicitly as you said, but uh, I did a 
sort of a pilot study for a project in a class uh, two terms ago. And I did include uh, whether it was part of a, like a complex or if it was freestanding. And it didn't have any predictive value at that time. And so I conveniently left it out of this analysis. Anything else? Okay, before we thank uh, Jay and Matt again, I will remind everyone, uh, next week we have our last speaker um, of the academic year, uh, Dr. Sandra Rosenblum, a professor from University of Arizona, speaking on if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, the planner's role in meeting the transportation needs of an aging society. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, and without further ado, let's thank Jay and Matt.